Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Brani and I am one half of the Indecisive Readers. Today I am here to do like a chatty relax video as a second part to a video I first did in November which was a discussion of feminism in The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. I really enjoyed this book generally and then more specifically I really enjoyed the feminism in it and I'm planning on rereading it soon, more about that soon, but when I did this video it was just kind of about the feminism generally in the book and I floated the idea of doing a comparison of this book to other books or films or TV shows or something and that is what I'm here to do today. I'm not necessarily going to compare the book to other books but I'm going to compare bits of feminism I have kind of extracted from this to other books. To tackle this book for the first time I feel like the easiest way to do it would be to split it in various parts. I have as of yesterday posted a breakdown of the book into 50 page chunks that we are going to read a week at a time so we will cover the book in about 16 weeks. The read-along will be running from the 4th of May to the 23rd of August and yeah we will cover all 805 pages of that in that time. Part 1 we will read from the 4th of May to the 7th of June. Part 2 we will read from the 8th to the 28th of June. Part 3 we will read from the 29th of June to the 12th of July. Part 4 we will read from the 13th to the 26th of July. Part 5 we will read from the 27th of July to the 9th of August and part 6 we will read from the 10th of August to the 23rd. Obviously you've got the freedom to read it whenever you want within those times or outside of those times but they are the times I will be reading it so if you want to join in with me feel free. We will be using the hashtag the Priory of the Read Along and come and join in the support group. There are 13 points about feminism I have chosen for a discussion. I'm not necessarily going to talk about them all, but I'm just going to quickly list them all. The first is women just being in power. The second is women having to fight to be in power. The third is women not being in power at all. The fourth is women having their story stolen. The fifth, women telling their story. And the sixth is women literally losing their voice. The seventh is women having a purpose in the story and the eighth is women just there as an object. Nine is a feminist book, play, film, whatever, with traditionally feminine things. Ten is sex for pleasure versus for duty. Eleven is women not fighting each other. Twelve is something I don't agree with but it's the Bechdel test because it's feminism so we're going to talk about it. And thirteen is powerful women equaling villains. Should we start with the Bechdel test? Let's start with the Bechdel test. What do you think of the Bechdel test, Sam? I think it has its place, but it's deeply flawed. Yeah. 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 Okay. A voice from the background. <laughs> um, the Bechdel test has three very simple rules. Is it three, Sam? I believe so. It has to have more than two female characters. Mm. It has to have these female characters having a conversation about anything other than a man. Maybe it's only two rules. I feel like there are three. Mm. But it has very simple rules and it's just to include female characters and for those female characters to have a conversation other than to have a conversation about a man. So they can't just be there as like the love interest and her friend discussing the male character or they can't just be discussing the male character state of the world or something it has to be a bit more complicated than that however whilst it's a very low bar to hit a lot of a lot of things miss it and a lot of things miss it that are feminist so two things I'm not going to talk about in this video, but we'll obviously mention here, are the Harry Potter books and Fifty Shades of Grey. Two quite varied books and two quite varied stories. So I think even if you haven't read the Harry Potter books, you know that they 
include a fair few interesting female characters that do stuff, they help save the day, they have important roles in the story. And Fifty Shades of Grey is all about an abusive boyfriend and the girl that falls in love with him. And I imagine you think you know which one passes, but the fact that I'm talking about it, it makes you probably think that that's wrong. Fifty Shades of Grey as a film passes it, and the Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix film doesn't, because we follow Harry, and so any female character is interacting with Harry or talking about Harry. So you don't get Hermione and Ginny, who are amazing female characters, talking, but you do get is it Anastasia in Fifty Shades of Grey. You get her talking to the secretary, presumably about the job, I haven't seen it, but that just shows how flawed it is. You, it doesn't have to be a good book or a good film to pass it. And so I think it's a really bad measure of feminism, but I just felt like I should include it. And maybe I'll just be like, tick, it does, or cross out, no, it doesn't. The first book I'm going to talk about in comparison to The Priory of the Orange Tree is To Kill a Kingdom by Alexandra Cristo. This is a dark retelling of The Little Mermaid fairy tale but with sirens. There are mermaids in it but the sirens are the main characters. It follows the siren princess who every year has to steal a prince's heart and a prince who is also a siren killer and is determined to follow this siren princess who keeps murdering princes. Because this is a The Little Mermaid retelling, it of course involves the main female character losing her voice. And this seems to be quite a common trope in books that women don't have a voice or they lose their voice and the plot kind of is centralised around that. And in this the main character, Lyra, doesn't necessarily lose her voice, but she kind of loses her singing voice, which for a siren is a pretty vital thing. And so it was quite nice not to have her literally not be able to talk. She could still be sassy and fierce and do all the normal, typically scary siren things but without the singing and the luring people in which is the whole point where the little mermaid can't sing and he can't recognize her she just can't sing and kill people which isn't a bad thing so for the trope of a woman losing her voice but still having an agency to be reversed it's a good thing i really enjoyed how it was done in this there are a lot of strong female characters but they are created in a way where they're villainous depending on who's telling the story because the women are telling the story in this they get the chance to say yes we're powerful but we're not all bad there are some women in this who aren't good who are villains but there are just as many that are getting to tell their own story and are good with an evil twist. In this story, women are in power just because that's how it is. Like in Priory, the rule of a kingdom is passed down through the daughters rather than through the male line, like it is in England and a lot of other places with royalty where the crown passes through sons. It's just passed through daughters in this world and it's not thought of as anything special or anything weird that's just how it is but there are some other kingdoms in it where I think women are in charge because they're born first but it may just be they fight for control I can't remember I read it last year and finally the women in this story have a purpose they do things to the story whether that's falling in love or fighting in a battle or ripping out princes hearts it has a purpose to the story. They're not just there as villains. They're not just there as the love interest. When something happens to the women in this story, it happens for a reason. Let's compare that to The Princess Bride, the one with all the agency. 
or the sexy lamppost? Did you call her a sexy lamppost? Uh, sexy, sexy lamp, I think. Sexy lamp, she doesn't even get to be a lamppost. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, the next one I'm going to discuss is The Princess Bride, so a film which is based on the book, but I haven't read the book or can't remember the book so we're gonna we're gonna discuss the film because I like the film but as a feminist masterpiece it is not. The Princess Bride is how would you describe the Princess Bride? It's like your typical swashbuckling princess fairy tale isn't it? Mm. Kind of told in a bit of a sarcastic way with really, really bad special effects that make it kind of good. Like, they're so bad, they're good kind of thing. The story follows a princess called Buttercup and she fell in love with a farm boy called Wesley when she was young, but obviously because he was a farm boy, she couldn't fall in love. So, video was briefly interrupted by a phone call, but anyway, we're back. So yeah, Princess Bride, she is about a woman who falls in love with one guy and because he has supposedly died and she cannot live without him, she marries a prince. And then she is rescued by a swashbuckling pirate who fights various different tasks like swashbuckling, is that a task? Fighting strength and wit and things. While she just sits at the side and basically does nothing. I mentioned how a lot of books women literally lose their voice and I don't think she necessarily loses her voice but she doesn't seem to have anything to say anyway so losing her voice probably wouldn't necessarily add or detract from the story. When I showed it to Sam he explained to me that she is a sexy lamp I think that is the technical term for a woman who is just pretty at the side, just doesn't add anything, just is there in the film. She doesn't do anything, she's just there as an object. She could be replaced by a sexy lamp and the story would work just the same. All that happens that she does is she gets people in trouble. She's like one of those women where she just pulls people in and does this and they have to rescue her and she just doesn't do anything and the film I enjoy but the character is frustrating and if there was talk of them remaking it and I'd be interested to see how they remade it because would they like update her story or would they just make it with better special effects or what would they introduce a second female character because I want to say there isn't one there is the witch that shouts boo at her a lot do you remember like Boo! Boo! You loved him! Oh no, she's talking about, she's talking about Wesley. She tells Buttercup that she's doing wrong for marrying the prince rather than going after the lover she believes to be dead. So, boo Buttercup. There's not a lot to say about feminism in it because it doesn't exist. I told Sam I'd love to rewrite it with the pirate being a female or something. I still do, but things get distracting. Someone else should rewrite it with women being the main force and I probably wouldn't mind that Buttercup does nothing because at least the pirate is a bit more feminine. The second book I have to talk about is Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Marillier. This is a retelling of Irish or Celtic folklore, but also a retelling of the Seven Swans or the Six Swans or the Seven Brothers or something by the Brothers Grimm, where six brothers get cursed by the stepmother. Because again, powerful women must be villains. Always stepmothers as well. Stepmothers are the worst according to fairy tales, which isn't a good good story to be telling children but this folklore fairy tale thing the evil stepmother transforms the six brothers into swans and the sister has a year to rescue them 
but in that year she cannot like speak a word to anyone she can't tell anyone why she's doing it to rescue them she has to spin them all a shirt made out of what is essentially stinging nettles and she can't tell anyone why she's doing it and she has to do it using her own hands and so her hands get all sore and she's sad because she's all alone and she just has a pretty rubbish time of it. I read this also last year for the Miss Tate Readathon and it was a really really interesting book. I really enjoyed it, I liked it, it was very slow. But this is another story where women have no voice. Like I said, she literally has to lose her voice for a year and despite narrating it herself, she can't talk. So it's just all like internal monologue and people talking at her. So uh, she must just be a bit stupid because she can't talk or I wonder why our sister can't talk. And no, it must be more than a year because I think it starts when she's like 12 and finishes when she's 16. Maybe I think she might be 10 at the start as well. Because I think they only transform twice a year and they meet up more than two times. I don't know, that wasn't relevant. Yeah, so this has a woman telling her story, but also she can't speak her story in the like end. She does tell her story, but other people are still dictating it for her. She's surrounded by six brothers who, when she admits who she wants to marry, they're like, no, he's English. Boo the English when they're Irish and that's bad. And they're telling her who she should marry or who she shouldn't marry. But she does kind of put her foot down and be like, hang on, guys, without me, you'd still be swans. Sharp noise. So... It's frustrating that she loses her voice, but it's a retelling of a fairy tale, so there's nothing... To say it's not problematic is untrue, but to say, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I just, I picked it up as a trope and that's what lots of books do and I don't know what to say other than it happens and it's frustrating. Mm. But at least in this book, it had a purpose, at least she lost her voice for a reason, rather than just it being a plot point like in feminist dystopias like A Hermit's Tale and Vox where they lose a voice because they're women and they shouldn't talk. Yeah. At least this was a part of the story. I mean it's not it's not so much an at least as just a slightly different way of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's any better or worse, it's just different. Mm. I don't know. No. Women should have a voice, guys. Yeah, no. Let's stop writing the stories where women have to lose their voice for the sake of the story mm. to move the plot along. We'll go on to Vox and Hermes Sale another day because. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll do one. It's specifically on feminist dystopias, that would be a good one. Mm. I think that would be a good idea. It would. Yeah. I should have done like fairy tales. I kind of am actually without thinking. And then next time I can do like historical retelling. So I can do like Circe and other. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, okay, that's cool. I like, I like the sound of that. Well done me for magic in a, a reasoning to my madness well there's method you. to my madness yet also in this book it does include things that are typically feminine but aren't necessarily done in a feminist way but are central to the story so she has to sew these shirts out of this material she has to make herself and so the act of weaving and the act of creating something is a feminine thing and was usually something just that men would get women to do to just pass their time. Like, there, there, make this blanket for the child. There, there, patch this shirt. And it made them, I imagine, feel useful. But for men, it probably didn't really have any purpose. But in this story, the 
act of making something and sewing something is almost seen, seen as quite empowering. None of the other characters could have done it, none of the brothers could have done it and so this allows this girl to do a feminine thing and she's not belittled for being able to do it, it's an important thing and good on Sorsha. So next to discuss are the last two films and the first is Maleficent which is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty but Maleficent's point of view so it gives reason to her evilness or what has been perceived as evil since we've been told it originally and it shows that some pretty terrible things were done to her. Again it's kind of a trope is the wrong word but in text a horrible sexual act it's not a sexual act in it it's like he cuts her wings off and a lot of people have read that as a metaphor for rape and it's frustrating when something like sexual assault is used as a plot point for moving the plot along it does the same in daughter of the forest but some feminist texts do reclaim women's sexuality and one that does that but i'm not going to discuss is girls of paper and fire but anyway off topic so maleficent is this female character who is powerful and therefore throughout society has been named a villain by the characters in that and then by us we're made to celebrate the fact that she gets slayed by a prince when she turns into a dragon because she has made everyone fall into an eternal sleep and that's bad and the retelling that is Maleficent is interesting because she doesn't get defeated and you don't need true love's kiss to save the day. It's also a good retelling because it gives women the chance to tell their own story. Again we've been told by presumably the prince who has been telling the story all the time about how he rescued his princess and he justifies kissing this sleeping girl which is creepy. Um, Sam's nodding in the background saying yes it's creepy because it is the original fairy tale. Did you know the, in the original fairy tale he sleeps with her and she wakes up when she gives birth to triplets. What? Jesus. Yeah. Fairy tales are weird. I, it'd be a bit weird if I woke you up with a kiss and we've been together for three and a half years but to just kiss someone you don't know who's just, just lying there. That's... The true love's kiss is a weird concept mm. like it's not necessarily a healthy thing to be teaching young girls that's good so true love's kiss is the worst and basing a story on that is also the worst and so the fact that maleficent redoes that and tells her own version of the tale explains why things went wrong for her and why she's the way she is but just hearing how she became magical and great. It's good. We like. The final film I want to talk about and the final thing I want to talk about today is Mulan. I was really looking forward to seeing the new remake which was meant to come out at the end of this month but because of reasons cinemas aren't open anymore so I don't know when I'll get to see that but I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I enjoyed the Disney original. I've not read any like Chinese versions of the tale. I have read The Hand, The Eye and the Heart by Zoe Marriott. That one was bad. But Mulan as a story I've enjoyed. Mulan as a woman from history who had to dress up as a man I feel like isn't as unusual as maybe it seems because where women couldn't do stuff to do stuff you had to pretend to be a man that's not unusual there were um pharaohs that would dress up as men there were women who would dress as men to go and fight in the trenches all sorts of things because you just couldn't do it as a woman until quite recently and i mean even in countries now i feel like there's still trouble getting in the military 
And so Mulan is an unusual and I quite like Mulan and I will tell you why I don't like the hand behind the heart. So in Mulan it is a woman dressing up as a man and at the end they accept her for being a woman. In the hand behind the heart and quite a lot of Mulan retellings, Mulan is transgender or non-binary so a woman who actually wants to be a man or doesn't want like specific names and goes to war and takes on a more male presence because that's what's accepted and what frustrates me about this is that it almost means that women can't do it or that a woman's part in it isn't as important so the Mulan one itself like I said she's a woman and just dresses up as a man for the sake of it but these new retellings, I'm not saying we shouldn't have transgender and non-binary stories, but it almost feels like they're taking away a woman's chance to be telling that story. And so in Mulan, women aren't in charge and they can't fight in battles, but at least when she does, it's okay. So yeah, at least she has a purpose in the story. It tells like two sides of being a woman. It tells being a woman as someone who has to get dressed up and get married and do all these duties and then it tells Mulan who goes along and defies these conventions not necessarily because she wants to be a man but because she wants to fight and she can only do that as a man and I like Mulan but I don't like the hand behind the heart and I want I want to watch the new Mulan and can someone let me go to the cinema anyway <laughs> I feel like I haven't said anything worthwhile. <laughs> I feel like I've just babbled for half an hour, which I'm pretty sure I have. This will be interesting to cut down. Mm. In terms of Priory, compared to these, this is based on a legend from British folklore, so George and the Dragon, and Samantha Shannon did a really interesting essay on it called Down Souls Under Stress and it's about all the women that have inspired this and characters from history like Caliba who is the woman of the woods and Clea Lind who is in this as the damsel and these women from history have both lost their voice and get to tell their story so half the world know their story but half of the world don't and that half seem to be a lot louder they're like no it was the man the man saved the day but the reality is he didn't and it's telling us that sometimes that's not always the case and so seeing more stories like to kill a kingdom or maleficent is really good to allow women that chance to tell their own story. Fortunately, none of the main characters in this lose their voice. There are some, yeah, that lose their story, but these ones are getting to tell their story. They're getting to do things. They're not just there as an object. All the women from history had a purpose, especially when they're like told in a story. The stories in this are just amazing. There are so many fairy tales in this, but none with evil stepmothers who cut off their stepson's heads. There are some stepmothers who sleep with their sons, but that's, that's another thing. <laughs> Enjoy that when you get to there. The women in this do do traditionally feminine things. They have like an obligation to be a mother and a wife as much as they have to be a ruler, but that's almost kind of entwined with it. Like you need to be a wife to keep your line going which is still a pretty rubbish thing but it's good they definitely passed the Bechdel test because the women that fall in love don't fall in love with men sometimes sometimes they do but that's another problem with the Bechdel test if they if they like women they could pass it because they're talking about women rather than men, but they're still talking about the love interest. I don't know, I just don't like the back doctor. Let's get rid of it. Let's come up with another one. Also, it doesn't pass for men in reverse. 
all the time. So anyway, it's, it's good. You should all read Priory and join me when I do. Yeah, so thank you if you are this far for watching and listening to my babble. If you enjoyed it, I will do this more often. So let me know in the comments if you did. Give it a thumbs up too. Let me know if there are any books or films you think I should check out or any topics you think I should check out. Next time I might do women from history or I might do, what other ones did I say, um, feminist dystopias or kind of powerful superhero-esque women. I don't know, we're gonna come up with some sort of system. Well, I wanna do songs as well. Let me know any feminist songs. I'd love to know some feminist songs because then I can put them on a playlist and empower myself. <laughs> Um, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, let me know, share if you enjoyed and let me know if there's anything you want me to do and I will see you in the next video. Bye!